Hey, welcome everybody this morning. Um, to get in yep all joining us now so thank you very much for joining this morning um welcome sunday morning 11 o'clock um or if you're down under thank you for joining again late this evening um i'm delighted this morning to be joined by um catherine rednell um and i'm going to read this introduction because there's so much of it <laughs> um catherine was uh, 18 when she won her first world indoor title in 2014 um and she's competed on that world stage every year since. She's, in that time, she's won the World Ladies Singles three times and the Mixed Players title once. She was a member of the Team England at uh, 2018 Commonwealth Games in Gold Coast, coming away with the bronze medal in triples. Also selected for the 2020 World Championships, which we know have been postponed until next year. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Catherine has represented England indoor in both the under 25 senior squad since 2014, currently ranked number one in the English indoor rankings. And all of that, and I, you're 24, is that right, Catherine? I am, yeah. That makes me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's an impress it's an, it, it, absolutely impressive uh, achievement. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, I've worked with you for those, um, what, six, six years since you've been on the, the World Bowls Tour uh events and you know just just being part of that officiating program and working with you it's been, um pretty impressive and humbling to watch you certainly win that first world title was um an incredible achievement at 18 so yeah thank you it's, it's been it's been great working with you and thank and thank you for joining this morning um hopefully it'll give them um, viewers a bit more interest and a few more questions rather than asking me the boring old umpiring questions um so hopefully we can get some some good questions to you. So I, I guess just in, in terms of um, your achievements, what stands out to you as the sort of highlight in all that? I guess there's lots of them, but you know, what's the highlight in those sort of years that you've been competing on the world stage? Um, I think there's got to be a few really. I think I always go back to when, when anybody asked me what my favourite, most favourite title to have won was, it's got to be the, the first one that I won, which was a champion of champions um, at Hailing Island when I was 16. Um, I think the first one's always the hardest and always the one you remember um, most. But of course, the world titles at Potters in front of the, the stage and for me, really a home crowd as well. Yeah. Um, and then obviously on the Gold Coast was um, an amazing experience to be playing out in Australia. I love Australia. I love Australian greens. Just everything about that was was fantastic. And then to come home with a medal as well, topped it off really. Yeah, uh, you and me both. I mean, I love Australia too. So yeah, <laughs> it's an impressive place to uh, take part in bowls. Um, I, I mean, of course, you know, I've talked in the introduction about everything you've done at world world level but you know you're absolutely prolific at uh, national <laughs> level as well i mean you're, you're just winning everything um, at national level so um let's not forget that um yeah it's, it's pretty impressive um so morning everybody um we've got a few people joining us david welcome i've got a question from david which i'll ask you later um and right joining us from christchurch in new zealand have you played in new zealand Catherine? No, I haven't. I've never been. Um, I would like to. Um, I've Lovely heard a few good stories about the greens and, and the scenery itself, but I've never been myself. Yeah, stunning country. Um, Bernie, good morning. Um, Alex Duckworth has managed to get up. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> um, um, and Weng Lim joined us from Auckland in New Zealand as well. So, so welcome to everybody. If you've got usual format, if you've got any questions, uh, for myself um, or Catherine, then please um, pop your questions in the Q&A um, button at the bottom of the um, Zoom window. Or if you're on Facebook, how many people got on Facebook? Yeah, a few coming in. Um, welcome to everybody. Steve, Stephen um, makes me feel old. That's because I am old. Yes, I know I am, Stephen. Thank you very much. <laughs> Don't need to be reminded. <laughs> Um, so let's sort of get into the other thing I, I wanted to sort of cover with you was um, the World Championships, which obviously we've talked about a lot um, in some of these Q and A's, um, which were due to be held in um, Gold Coast um, back in May, um, obviously postponed until next year. Um, you were selected um, as part of Team England, 
um, yeah. alongside Ellen, Lorraine, Sophie and Sean. Um, the, the question really for me was what disciplines were you due to play in that? Um, I was due to play the singles and the pairs with Ellen. Okay, right. Okay, I don't know if that was actually formally released or not, but they were they were the ones that were confirmed. So couldn't find it anywhere. Um, huh. um, and of course, you played you played the singles as well in in the um, Commonwealth. Yes, yeah, uh, I did yeah. Yeah, but obviously got the medal in the uh, triples. Yes. Um, Alex has asked who marked your first champion of champions. How are you likely to remember that? Oh no. Um... I suspect it might have been him. I was going to say, was that was that was that a uh, a question pointed out? I think it was either Alex or Vernon, but I can't remember. I can't remember. That's really bad, isn't it? I played Ellen in the final. I know that much. It was a long time ago. Now it was eight years ago. I know. Yeah. And why would you ever remember the marker, especially if it's Alex? <laughs> oh, hello, Alex. <laughs> um, Steve Sargent joining us uh, from Round Matty Beach in New Zealand. Sounds exotic. Apart from yeah. 11 p.m. Um, <laughs> so welcome, Sarge. I've got some questions from um, Steve as well to, to ask you. Um, question from Vic. How do you feel about the long-term future of bowls in the UK? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Um, <laughs> interesting one in the current climate. It certainly is, yeah. I think, I think before the COVID-19 dramas, if you want to call it that, I think there was definitely a real improvement on promoting the sport, especially in Australia and Southern Hemisphere. Um, over here, the likes of the barefoot bowls, um, getting new members and recruitment drives and things. I think it was all starting to go pretty well. Um, but obviously over the last few months, everything's been put on a standstill and there's, there's clubs that have closed. So I think it is certainly a very worrying time for bowls. Yeah, I mean, do there's, there's been a lot going on in England specifically. Um, you know, Bowls England have been doing a lot of work behind the scenes with um, a big survey and yeah. various other promotions as well. Um, I mean, I guess the hope is that that's going to encourage people to get back on the rinks uh, when we come out of this um, situation. But, you know, a lot of things I'm hearing around at the moment are that, you know, they've had, what, three, four months off of bowls. They haven't played bowls at all during yeah. the summer. Um, and it's kind of the attitude, well, do I really want to go back? I've found more things to do. I'm a bit more relaxed. You know, that I think that's a real worry with the sport now is that people are just going to think, can't be bothered anymore. Yeah, I think it'll it'll go one way or the other. And that is obviously the worry. For me, the first few weeks, I probably didn't miss it as much as I thought I would. Um, calendar's busy in the, in the first half of the year always. So it was nice to have a bit of a break. Um, as such and I, I always think a break makes you hungry for it again but I think there'll be the people that are eager to get back and then I think there'll also be those that really haven't missed it so, so aren't going to bother which obviously is, is a big worry for the sport. Yeah, it'd be, be sad if, if that's the case. Yeah. Um, going forward. Um, Mark, uh, Mark Cowan's uh, a colleague of mine on Laws Committee um, and also a fellow ITO from Australia. Um, he's asked, um, having watched you dominate the lead position at the World Challenge at Moama. What did you think of the concept, Australia versus the rest of the world and the Moama club in general? And that would, I, I forgot to mention that in the introduction, but um, I think probably the last international you played um, was um, at Moama club. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, um, I think that, that was the last that, event. That was kind of a, it's a bit like a, I don't know, a bit like a Ryder Cup format. It was a new format for um, World Bowls um, called the Challenge Cup. So what did you think of the concept? I thought it was absolutely brilliant from start to finish. Obviously, as, as it was the first um, sort of trial, if you like, of the event, I think things couldn't really have gone better. It was an absolute honour to represent um, the club for that. Hello. <laughs> um, sorry, the dog. <laughs> right. um, yeah, it was an honour to, to represent um, the rest of the world for that, alongside names you know that I've watched on, on telly and, and live for well since I was of a really young age to be honest and I, I think the event was lively it brought a new concept into the game um, the idea of the Ryder Cup style was fantastic because it meant you got to play so many different disciplines um, against so many different people and 
uh, my first lineup was quite overwhelming, really, because we, we started with the mixed triples, and um, Alex Marshall was obviously our captain, and um, he announced the lineup, and I was playing the triples with Joe Edwards and Alex Marshall, who are my two heroes of the game. I sort of got shivers and thought, oh my goodness! Yeah, and I, <laughs> but I that, that was fantastic. That's what's great about that 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 format is you know you're, you're selecting people from around around the world, and you know you're you're playing with heroes, I guess. In in, in yeah. Places. Um, and it's cer certainly a, an impressive lineup. Um, I, I hear rumours that you were pretty much the outstanding player of the, of the whole thing, anyway. So, um, so you know, you, you obviously did extremely well, and it, it, it's actually not a new format. I mean, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but um, that style of um, Ryder Cupy kind of thing, Australia versus the rest of the world, um, is not a new format. When I first started. Um, or just the lead up to the the world um uh bowls tour panel um we played um uh, a europe versus the west of the rest of the world right uk versus the rest of the world yeah the potters back in the sort of early 2000s oh wow and that would that was um sort of the forerunner you had people like steve glasson and kelvin kirko coming over and playing in that similar sort of format um and there was a whole bunch of officials coming in and um I think it was six of us and then from that we were selected as part of the world bowls tour or world oh, championships from that so um i'll forgive you for not remembering that because you were probably no i don't i was six. very old so. <laughs> <laughs> um so i mean it's, i'm hoping you know i think we're all hoping that that sort of format will continue on the world stage because it's, it's fantastic for you guys to play in that sort of thing um with players from all around the world as you as you've rightly said yeah absolutely well, thanks for that, Mark, for that question. Um, are they coming in? Ah, um, I'm not sure how much experience you got with this one, but um, Stephen Illich is um, heavily involved in the visually impaired um, game. Um, and he's asking if it, you've got any tips for line players to keep a consistent line. Oh, blimey. Um, <laughs> obviously, for the, for the Commonwealth, we were out there with the, um, the visually impaired um, players and it was incredible because I'd never really watched them play or, or experience that side of the game. And, and when you watch them um, on the green, it was amazing how sort of the techniques that they use to, to determine line and length. I think it's all probably in the mechanics, probably very similar to... Um, the game that we experience really and I think if, if your delivery is um, consistent, um, similar every time and it works then th there's no reason why it shouldn't sort of be the same concept as if you weren't visually impaired if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean it, it, from our point of view as officials as well it's, I mean, it's extremely humbling um, uh, marking for visually impaired players it's, it's a totally different concept um, you know, having to, having to give a distance of every bowl plus the the position of it on an upside down clock. Um, yeah. <laughs> upside down because we're standing behind the clock, obviously. So um, yeah, I mean, the, the first experience for me of of visually impaired bowls was at Manchester 2002, um, and it was yeah, humbling, in, incredible mm. experience. Um, Do you feel that you have to be more sort of switched on, and not that you're not in the first place, but more expectant of of questions if that makes sense because obviously in a, in a normal game you you get the usual sort of standard questions and you can anticipate what's coming but w with that respect there's obviously like you mentioned the clock face and and bits and pieces but do you feel like there is a lot more to sort of consider or in a different way yes um there's not that many questions in terms of um you know the usual questions that you, you would ask me for example as a marker they, they, they don't come but the, the, right. the, the bit that needs the concentration is work is, is making sure that you tell every tell the player every single bowl in its position um and its distance from the jack and of course where that really gets complicated is when things move um yeah and then you've got you've got to go back and start um rejigging things and, and um redescribing the head if you like um so from that respect yes it needs um a, a great deal of concentration and to, to be honest um telling the time upside down is damn difficult <laughs> <laughs> it's incredibly difficult um so you know there, there's always going to be a few little ifs and buts and errors and things coming in and that's that's what needs the concentration so it's, it's not the usual okay. sort of questions that you would you would ex expect to ask a marker mm. as such um 
yeah, intro, uh, yeah, you know, playing with very business, interesting. It's 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 great um, as it is with any player with disability. Um, and right from New Zealand. Um, do you have any other? We were just talking about this before we came online. Do you have any other employment, or is bowls your life? I think bowls is your life, but <laughs> yeah, um, I do. Yeah, I do have a full time job as well. Um, but I think bowls has always been such a big part of my life. Obviously, from a very young age, I've needed time off um, for national competitions, international events. So um, yeah, I think I think getting a balance is very interesting, and it's very important to have an employer that obviously respects that you need time off, respects that it, it is your life and it, it does take over. You know, for a lot of us, all of our holiday is taken for bowls. Yeah. Um, so I think getting a balance there is, um, is very important. Yeah, that's very similar for us, you know, taking annual leave for, for pretty much a, any tournament we do um, is, is tough, you know. Yeah. <laughs> balance right with family as well. Um, and of course, I, I guess, you know, obviously we, we have to mention um, your dad, John, um, who, you know, just one of the out, most outstanding leads, I think, mm -hmm. that England's ever had. Um, what's he on now? hundred and over a hundred caps, I think. Yeah. 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 He got his hundredth cap last year. Yeah. Um, so, you know, so, you're, yeah. you're coming, coming from an elite family. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Great. Um, David. I think it's always been difficult. Sorry, just to just yeah. about in there. I think it's it is very difficult because Dad's a real example. Um, Dad's been a music teacher all his life, um, so I think there are a lot more events such as World Bowls Tour, which Dad would have loved to have participated in. But obviously, if it falls in term time, he couldn't. So I yeah. think for a lot of people, it is very compromising yes. um, to obviously get time off and allowance and and whatnot. Um, and I, you know, I, I, there's not that many players that are full-time bowls. Certainly in this no. country. Um, no, absolutely not. It's, it's certainly different um, in places like Australia. But you know, in this country, there's very few people that have um, yeah. employment within bowls and can pretty much freely do what they need. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, there's there's a couple more questions that came in during the week, um, which sort of bring us on to some of the <laughs> things about uh, umpires and ITOs that mm -hmm. be interesting to get your views on. Um, Steve Sargent, um, uh, an ITO from New Zealand, um, has asked, is there anything that you like or dislike about things that ITOs or umpires do? <laughs> you, can be, you can be brutally honest. It's very interesting because um, I, I, and I think everybody would would share the same view that when you go to an elite event so um so potters um or commonwealth games um and i think you'd probably agree alan that the, the standard of the umpiring um and the officials are absolutely brilliant you you can rely on them you can trust them they're really on the ball it's, it's brilliant but there are some events that you you go to um sort of a bit closer to home where there is nothing more frustrating than um an umpire that doesn't really understand or doesn't give you the answers that you're looking for. And I think it massively affects your game. For example, I think maybe coming on to lollipops a bit, um, a bit later on, but I did have one incident, which I do look back and laugh at now. This was at Helling Island, actually. And I think Alex was probably there. Um, and was Vernon, if he's watching. Yeah. Um, there was, it was, I think it was the introduction of lollipops. I think it was the first year that they'd been introduced. And, um, Obviously, it's it is a very difficult concept to use lollipops. I'm not saying that I would like to, and timing of when you put the lollipops up and and whatever. But th this one game that happened was was certainly not ideal. That every time I got on the mat, the lollipops went in the air. Um, so I think I had six or seven ends where I was really quite frustrated um, that I was being told that I was three down when I stepped on the mat on my backswing um, that I, I I didn't really want to be reminded of um but yeah i think i think it's different you know all umpires do try their best and, and try to stick to the guidelines that they've been told but there is a real difference in standard of of umpires and officials dependent on sort of how high you go and what event you go to and i i, I guess in some ways that's right because you know you, there, there has to be a route of progression for anybody that's taken yeah. up training for the first time an official for the first time and then uh, you know appearing at, on the world stage you know mm. it's, it's down to experience and and competence as, as well um, and we all recognize that um of course the difficulty arises when you're playing at, at, 
at all levels. You know, you're not just playing on the world stage, but you're playing domestic games as well to to earn your place at nationals and and everywhere else. So you you're coming up against the full spectrum of officials with the full level of experience. Yeah. Uh, and you know, I guess what we want to try and do is is get get that level of standardization across the board so that you're not faced with those situations um which are quite clearly not what they've been taught you know <laughs> we drum it into people you know when you should use lollipops and, and the best time to do it um but also I, I guess it's worth mentioning that you're a very quick player um mm. compared to a lot of players and you know you're on, on the mat deliver the bowl and that's it and there's yeah from a marker point of view i mean it's easy for us on the on the portable rink um because we've got that little bit of time but from a from a marker point of view if they're not getting the time that the player um uh, is, is not giving them if you, if you like yeah um, their routine goes completely out the window <laughs> you know, what they've been taught and when to put the lollipops up and when not to put the lollipops goes completely out the window because you, yeah. you delivered the bowl before um <laughs> before had the chance um and that's you know that's obviously not a criticism of you as a player that's that's, a, that's that's part of the thing that they have to adapt to and and learn to to work with different players and and that obviously comes with time and experience yeah um, do you but, think there should be a standard sort of umpire i don't know if there are at the moment but but regulations and co and not coaching for umpires but sort of guidelines should that be standard throughout because obviously you guys on the on the world scene and and um big events and whatever do things very differently to what they're taught at maybe national and county level do you yeah. think that should be standard um at world level um probably not because we're dealing with a whole lot of uh, different um yeah instances. um certainly at um when we train umpires and i'm, I'm not going to speak for every country here but you know there is a standard um across the world in fact uh, just so where um, <laughs> that is the 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 world bowl standard so umpire development um, document sort of details um the training requirements for umpires and markers um across the world now each country then develops their own process um within their own body and oh, sorry <laughs> in england um <laughs> we use this as a training manual in england for um officials um, and that's roughly based on the world um, uh, document as well. Um, so yes, there is there is a level, there is a, a, a standard that needs to be achieved in terms of accreditation and, and um, uh, uh, examination and understanding of the laws. Um, but as you progress, part of it is down to experience um, and gaining that experience at different levels of the sport. Um, but when you certainly get to the world stage, when you go into the um, ITO, scenarios kind of rule out the, the the wbt side of things for the yeah. minute that's a totally different kettle of fish yeah um, when you get into the, the ito um kind of things there is still an accreditation process um but when you go to those events as you know as a player they are totally different to a national championship mm, absolutely um, and there's there's other things that we're having to deal with as officials which you would never experience anywhere else um and you can't teach that no, it's common sense, isn't it? And Some of it is, but it also, a, lot, a lot of it's mentorship as well. Right? Yeah. And having the experience and working with with people doing that for the first time um, is, is um, how they develop um, from that stage. So there is a standard, but it does, it does change when you get to um, the, the world events. As, as for WBT, totally different kettle of fish altogether. Yeah. yeah. As, as you well know. <laughs> As, as a player as well, it's a totally different kettle of fish. Um, yeah, so I mean, interesting um, the, with that. I mean, I guess the follow-on question really from that was, um, do you think there's anything that can be done to improve relations and support between players and officials? And I don't mean, I don't mean to say that there's there's poor relations between players and officials, but do you think there's anything we can do to work more closely with um, players, coaches? Um, countries you know governing bodies um to, to sort of get that mutual understanding of what's expected from both sides um it's a hard one really because i think like you say it does come down to experience and, and obviously confidence as an umpire and ito as well 
Um, I think at the world level, I think it's bang on. I've never, I've never experienced, um, especially playing a lot of singles, I've never experienced any sort of problems or issues where I wouldn't trust an umpire or trust a marker. Um, it is difficult because I think the only way you learn how to deal with, and every player is different as well. So obviously with, with some players, you're going to get a lot more time like to, for example, to chalk a bowl than you are, are others. Um, I, I think it's just, I think it is just experience really. Um, yeah. And working the different events, adapting to, to maybe different players if you've marked for them or, or officiated for them before. But, you know, I, I could never ever complain about a high level umpire or, or marker at all. Okay, that's reassuring. <laughs> Especially not yourself, Alan. Oh. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> Um, we're, we're all human. I know I've made some mistakes in your games, but they're, they're, we're all human. Um, we yeah. just laugh in the end, don't we? I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, another question from David, um, David White. Um, he would like to ask about your preparation for top matches, such as world finals. What do you do in the hour or so before the matches to get in the right frame of mind? Um, how do you um, do that? I don't really have any routines or rituals. I'm fairly laid back and, and, and whatnot when it comes to preparation. I think that the worst thing for me would be having to sit there and probably focus on what's going to come. I think that would probably develop some nerves or, or unwanted um, thoughts, maybe. It's just about keeping relaxed. You know, I, I, I don't like to get anywhere too early before a game I, you know I couldn't think of anything worse than turning up before a game with an hour to spare and looking at my watch every five minutes yeah. um, I think it's just probably get in the zone get yourself self ready relax have a drink um, and, and just sort of have a chat with anybody that's there really I know different scenarios are different um, dependent on sort of where you are and whether it's televised or um, not televised or whatever but I think for me it's just to keep calm and keep relaxed yeah. I don't really have any rituals that I would swear to or or run by. And I, I guess uh, you know things like uh, World Championships, Commonwealth Games. Um, your your ritual before the game is is kind of dictated by what the coaches want want to do and um, yeah, the, the warm up routines and bits and pieces that we see some players do and some countries do. Um, I guess you're more, you know, it's very different to being on, on the the portable rink at Potters playing a singles than it is um, playing in the Commonwealth Games with as as a whole team. And um, I guess there's that influence there that helps you prepare um, going into the game. Um, yeah. I guess for me, following up from that, um, you know, during the game, you know, you're very, you're very independent when you play bowls. You you know, you're you know exactly what you're going to play. You know what shots you play, and you play them quickly. Mm. Um, when it comes to those world events um, where you have a coach at the end of the rink, how much influence do they have on you um, and how much do you rely on them or, or, or seek their advice when you're playing? I think being brutally honest, I learned a lot from um, probably the Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast in respect to this because I've, I've never had, you know, if you're not put in that situation, you don't have a coach, you don't have somebody sitting behind the rink um that's there but I think the main role of a coach is to facilitate the player yeah. you know they're there to give support they're there to, if you want to drink a water to go and get your water bottle I think the supportive role of a coach is just to sit there quietly <laughs> sounds awful but just to sit there quietly and look after the player however much they want to be looked after and I know it's very different for different individuals you know myself go back to the Gold Coast um, in my singles, I had John Bell with me and, and John couldn't have been better. He sat there, he clapped all my good balls if I wanted to have a rant about something, particularly the, the game televised against Joe Edwards. Yep. Um, you know, if I wanted to go and have a rant or ask John a question, I'd literally hop up onto the bank, ask him, he'd give me a short, sweet answer, brilliant, off we go again. And I, I think it very much depends on what type of a player you are. If, if you rely heavily on a coach, then that's absolutely fine. If you, if you want to ask somebody what shot you think you should be playing, absolutely fine. Not, not my style at all. Mm. Um, but it, it is very personal. And I think the, the most important thing is developing a good relationship, equal relationship with, with the coach that's there, there for you. 
Sure. And I, I guess 90% of the time with John Bell, you, he's going to crack a joke anyway. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I remember um, coming off, I think I'd, I'd played something which had gone horrendously wrong against Joe and I just went off and I obviously had a, a not very impressed face on and John just cracked a joke. We sort of laughed about it and then you, you get on with the next end and that is exactly sort of, that's me. That's what I need from a coach. I don't need somebody to say, well, should you have played that? Should you not have played it? You know, what what should you have done? You know, that just throw me completely. I just need a bit of humour, a little yeah. chat, and then off off again. I am quite independent. At the end of the day, it's gone. Get over it. Move on. Yeah, exactly. You know, you've, 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 exactly. You can't, can't sort of dwell too much. Um, no, absolutely. Back, looking back on it, um, it's, I, I, we covered a little bit of the, this. Um, there was a couple of questions came in earlier this morning from uh, Sue mates. Um, Who's um, who's also a newly qualified ITO um, from England? Um, she asked a couple of questions. The first one, which I think we've covered a little bit of, but um, it might be worth just recapping. What what are your expectations of an umpire and marker during the game? Um, and you can refer to Alex and Vernon if you want to. But um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what sort of expectations do you have? I, I guess of an umpire first of all. You know, what what are you expecting from an umpire um, when you call them? If you use them, um, I think you just would expect a fair result. You know, somebody to come on, make the decision, and then disappear again, <laughs> for want of a better way of putting it. But um, yeah, somebody that is is prompt, efficient, knows what they're doing, and somebody that you can trust as well. Because we've all had it. The worst thing is calling an umpire on when when you fancy your own bowl and they give it to the opposition. Yeah. And um, you know, we've all had it. It happens. Um, at certain events, but you just want somebody that is going to give a fair fair result. Yeah. Um, and from marking? Um, from marking, I, I think, again, we've all experienced good ones, we've all experienced horrendous um, situations as well, but you want a marker that's going to just facilitate the game, support both players, give you the answer that you're looking for and just keep the game running smoothly. Um, you, you know, I could, I could number a, a list of different scenarios where things have been not very good but you just want somebody that knows what question that you're going to ask especially for me because I'm so quick as well you know yeah. if, if I say how far short was my last goal or or um who's got second or how many thirds or or sort of different questions rather than who holds you want yeah. them to be anticipating that that's coming give you a, a snap answer and and then you can get on with it and it, I mean it, yeah. Clearly, you know, we've worked a lot together on the rink um, and, you know, I think we, we understand each other pretty well in, in terms yeah, of player versus player. Um, do, you, do you treat um, uh, officials at um, the world level differently to um, domestic um, markers, umpires? I mean, do, do you ask the same sort of questions? Are you expecting the same sort of accuracy, same sort of yeah. answers? I think, again, that's where it's different, obviously, different situations. So a more domestic um, or close to home game, even as far as national finals, you're still asking the same questions that you obviously need an answer to. But maybe the trust isn't there quite so much. Whereas when, you know, the likes of you, yourself, Alan, Dan, Sandra, you, you aren't asked that question and you've got 100% faith in the answer you're getting back. So it, it's much easier to get on with the game confidently when you've got a marker that you you rely on, you trust, um, and you know is going to give you the correct answer or the answer that you're you're wanting. Yeah. Cool. I mean, that's a great question, Sue. Thanks for, for popping that through. Um, anybody else um, got any questions, just pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the, uh, the screen there. Um, just type your answers in and we'll do our best to answer them for you. Um, and uh, thank you for the few that are joining. Um, uh, now, so welcome. Um, the other question for from Sue was, um, "What's the best, oh, this is going to be a bit controversial? What's the best thing and the worst thing that's happened to you during a game from an umpire and marker perspective?" Um, but yeah, I think we've kind of covered some of the mistake situations, the lollipop situation, and some of the bits that go on. Um, is there anything that's really you felt was a bit of a game changer? Because that's, I, I think that's our worst case scenario. Is if if we make a decision that's a game changer. There's been a few of them. Yeah, absolutely. I can't, I can't particularly remember um, anywhere it's really changed a game um, where 
you know, I, I'm one to go up and have a look anyway. You know, if, if I don't have complete trust in a marker or, or their decision, then I would probably just go up and have a look anyway. It saves a lot of time. Um, so you're getting cross as well. Yeah. Um, I think the funniest, and Sandra McLeish will remember this, um, the first year at Potter's, Sandra marked my final um, against Bex. And Sandra actually had to tell me that I'd won. Um, my my maths during a game is, is not spot on. You know, I just sort of get on with it. But I turned to Sandra on the last end of the second set and I went, is that it? And I actually wasn't completely sure that I'd won. And Sandra had to confirm that I had. So luckily, Sandra Sandra was good at her maths and knew what she was talking about. Um, but that that is quite a humorous one. And Dad and I actually spoke about that yesterday and laughed about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, get, I guess that's something that's reasonably unique on, on that portable rink situation where, you know, we're working with you. You know, there's, there's three officials on there. Uh, <laughs> any one game working with you to, to keep you right. Um, I mean, I th we, we'll draw the line at telling you when the shot clock's going to go off, but... <laughs> <laughs> Um, but certainly, I don't get close enough to that anyway, it's not a problem. <laughs> no, you're too fast, you're lucky to get it down to 15. <laughs> um, but cer certainly in terms of uh, keeping the score going and, and keeping things um, running and keeping you on track, you know, that's something we want to try and um, do and work with you to do. Um, there's nothing worse than not knowing where you are in the game. No, absolutely yeah. not. And I think I think that's a really individual, unique scenario, you know, on, on the World Bowls Tour at Potters or yeah. um, wherever it may be, because you've got so many cameras to worry about. You're mic'd up as well, so you've got to be careful what you say. You know, you, you're constantly worrying about being in the way. And I think that was a game you marked for me, Alan. Might have been the first year as well, where I kept standing in front of the camera and, you know, like, cover your microphone. Can you just move out of the camera? I think we got the giggles, goodness knows how many times. But it is a really <laughs> unique situation. Yeah. Colourful language sometimes as well. You yeah. Know, you never want to be <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just make sure you cover your mic or turn it off and you're yeah. fine. And that, you know, that's what's, the, for, for, from our point of view, and I, I'm sure I speak for Dan and um, uh, Francis and Mike, you know, from our point of view, that's what's great working with you guys is, um, is that we, we can have a bit of a laugh and we, you know, we can take it seriously, seriously when we need to take it seriously, but we can have a bit of a laugh. We get on, mm. and we're there to help you. Um, and it, you know, it all pans out well in the end. Um, and as you, as you said earlier, if we make a bit of a boo-boo, then we <laughs> have a laugh about it, hopefully, um, <laughs> as long as it's not a game changer. Okay. Um, welcome everybody for joining. There's a few people on Facebook now. Um, oh, Sandra's joined us. Um, Hi, Sandra. Uh, you must have heard, heard her, <laughs> her, her ears were burning there. Um, Alison Douglas has joined us, Roger Black. It's wet in Scotland, apparently. Um, so, so welcome, everybody. If you've got any questions, um, please pop them into the Q&A um, or the comments on Facebook, and we'll do our best to answer them. Um, just one popped in now. Stephen Illich, um, just wondering if you've both completed the Bowls England survey about the future of the game. I have. Yeah, I have as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think from, from my point of view, there was there was a lot of stuff that wasn't relevant because um, I don't play a lot of bowls. Um, in fact, I, I I don't play competitively now at all. Um, so that, you know there wasn't a lot of um, relevance in some of the questions for me. But I, I still feel them in as if I was playing. Um, and I think I think it's a fantastic concept to get that survey out there. What well, they've had about three thousand um, responses now. Yeah. Right? And you know if if something comes out of that and guides the game, um, changes the way. Um, certainly in England that we we do things then that's that's got to be a bonus um I mean what if, what's your view on we, we talked a little bit about coming out of Covid and, and getting back in the game but you know what do you feel about this I guess the number of competitions is the bit that worries me quite a lot in England you know the amount of stuff that you guys have to play in yeah to, but the amount of stuff that you, you you kind of end up playing in um and then when it comes to national championships you get all those clashes and and challenges yeah. and as you said time off is a problem how do you think with that's going to pan out um from this survey do you think there's going to be any change to competition play um i think i think the the pandemic at the moment and the, how coronavirus and, and and the effects of that have you know played on bowls clubs because obviously ours in particular and we were only talking about it the other day are only opening um four rinks so, you know, there's a lot of entries for us national-wise and if we're all 
you know, fighting over four rinks to all play our nationals on, yeah. it's just going to be impossible. For smaller clubs, it, it might be all right that don't have so many entries, but if we were all drawn at home, there's going to be absolutely no way that evenings are going to be able to facilitate all of our rinks. Yeah. Um, I think maybe condense just for this year, condense the number of competitions running. I just, I don't know what the answer is, to be completely honest. Yeah, I think the, the most important thing is just getting back to bowls. Yeah. Um, for, yeah. for clubs, for, for organisations and, and for us as players as well. Sure. Um, One step at a time. You know, that's all yeah, need. absolutely. Um, uh, what about the new chief executive? Any, any views on how John's going to take things forward for England? Um, well, coming from a hockey background, um, obviously wants to, to promote the sport and, and grow the sport. So I think it's only going to be um, a, an improvement for the sport and hopefully um, working on new things with the players, listening to the players' views as well. Um, I know there's been you know, some criticism in the past of, of things being done to, to suit organisations and, and timings and officials and whatever. But I think it, if it's listened as much as possible to the players, you know, give bowlers what they want and need um i think it's just going to be steps in the right direction sure yeah yeah i mean the other the other thing i guess um it's worth talking about is um the lead up to 2022 in um birmingham or mm. the bowls will be in Lenin, yeah. um the home of the nationals for for england um i mean that's for, for england that's um an exciting prospect well for the uk it's an exciting prospect to have a home games um yeah you know, the, last, the last games in, in England was in um, uh, Manchester in 2002 and the, the last UK games was in Glasgow. So it's, it's going to be great to have that on our doorstep again. Um, I guess you're in the running. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like so, to hope so. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it makes up for missing out on the World Championships. Um, Does, yeah. <laughs> There's been, a, there's been a few questions I've seen about, you know, why, why are Bowls England promoting this this so highly? Why, you know, why are we so, um, why are we pushing the Commonwealth 2022? From a Bowls perspective, you've played in the Gold Coast and, you know, I've, I've been involved in five Commonwealths. What's your take on how important Commonwealth is for Bowls? Commonwealth is the highest you can go. Um, both both the world and the Commonwealth stage, but it's for me it's by far the the biggest event and the most different event I've ever been involved in, and it, it is the pinnacle of the sport. Um, I think it's so important to push and promote the sport over here in general, but also it being a home games just to get the support. I mean, you'll you'll know Alan as as much as I do the crowds that were at the Gold Coast. Um, you know, for for me to play my first. Um, Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast, which was which is the home of bowls. Australia is the home of bowls, um, and to have the crowds that came in and the the publicity, it was just incredible. And I think if we can do anything to to get anywhere near as close as that to promote a home games, it's just so important to just celebrate the sport, celebrate what we've got coming to Leamington as well. Yeah, I mean, if we get half the crowd that we had in 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 Gold Coast, that would that be That's an amazing incredible. atmosphere. I mean, to to reproduce that atmosphere over in England would be be absolutely incredible. It it absolutely. was. Uh, yeah, there were one or two times when I was on the rink um, where you got goosebumps. Um, yeah. Especially when things you know were getting rowdy and you know the the players were getting roused by the the noise. Um, and to have the constant background music as well, which which created that really nice atmosphere. Um, yeah. A nightmare for us when we're marking, because we couldn't hear <laughs> what the players were saying, but um, it certainly did create that. If we can reproduce anything like that in, in Leamington um, in two years' time, that's going to be an incredible experience for people to watch and play in. Yeah, I, th I think it would be, it'd be differently received over here, because obviously, you know, there was, there was beer tents, there was... Um, food, drink, school. Yeah, I think yeah. it will be probably more reserved just because of the nature of the sport over here. But to have, you know, almost like a rugby crowd or a football crowd sitting behind the Aussies rink when they were playing, you know, for them, it, for us, like you say, goosebumps and, and an amazing feeling. But for them to be playing on home greens in front of that crowd, the atmosphere must have just been ridiculous. You know, the final of the men's singles, Aaron Wilson and, and the whole crowd behind him yeah. was just, you know, it was breathtaking.
Yeah, and there's me trying to concentrate on a ring two weeks yeah. away <laughs> on the bronze match. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, forget it. I was watching that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it will. I'm, I'm sure it'll be a great games. Um, you know, every every Commonwealth I've been to has been, has been different, but um, a fantastic experience, and as, as certainly um, Bowles has really pulled it off in terms of um, production and and sport and and everything in terms of uh, promotion. So hopefully England will do the same and, um, you know, we're looking forward to it. Um, clearly world championships um, were due to happen this year. They're postponed until next year. Yeah. Um, still very much up in the air um, as to whether they're going to go ahead because of, you know, second peaks and, and you know, Queensland, for example, just announced that they've, they've got some more cases going on. So mm. it's hard to see at the moment whether the World Championships um, are going to go ahead as scheduled in, in May or June. Um, so, you know, watch this space, I guess. And you know, for years, yeah. it's, it, it's, I guess, frustrating because you would have clearly wanted to play um, a World Championship outdoor. That'd be your first one, wouldn't it? You'd that be, would, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah it would, yeah. So, um, it'd be incredible to play in a world championship, clearly, but it's obviously frustrating for you as players not being able to get out there. I think it's the unknown, really. You build yourself up to obviously we should have been there a few months ago, but you just have to accept that it is the, the current situation at the moment. There is nothing you can do. And, and you know, if Australia aren't going to let people over their borders and because of quarantine regs, you can completely understand why. And that's the most important thing at the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? If it doesn't go ahead, so what? We'll wait another So be it. Yeah, um, make the next one a big jamboree. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, Mark Cowan, um, talking of uh, talking of the World Championships, Mark Cowan would have been the Chief Technical Officer for, um, for the World Championships. He's obviously frustrated as well. Um, he's asked, is Catherine's goal to play singles in 2022 or what discipline is your favourite to get picked in? Oh, is this for the next Commonwealth, yeah? Uh, 22, yeah. 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 Um, well, I'd, I'd be the first to say that my um, my record on outdoor greens is nowhere near as good as it is on indoor greens. You know, it's uh, the quicker the better. Southern Hemisphere greens are what really suits me. And I, I think the team for the Commonwealth, knowing who's available, it will be the strongest team picked. You know, I'd, I'd like a place. I'm not really, not really fussed where I play. I'd just like a place. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know... Ideally, a Leeds position would be where I would be most suited over here, um, over here on our greens, I think. But yeah, you know, the team's going to be one that is a very strong team, possibly the strongest with the people available that we've seen for, for a long time. Mm. So um, we'll just have to see, see what happens. I mean, I, I, you know, looking at it from the outside in, I, I certainly see the, the Team England squad developing. I've seen it develop over the number of years. Um, you know, it's it's really, really in a good place at the moment, in my view. But you know, as a as a player within the squad, I don't know what you feel. But um, you know, looking at it from the outside in, it's it's developed so well, um, and it's it's a really strong squad. We've come away with some fantastic medals in the last few games, um, and and really kicked off. Well, I guess I, I guess it kicked off in Delhi. Um, that's where yeah. everything really. Um, hit home for, for Team England is how well we did in Delhi, um, walking away with so many medals, and it's just, just gone mm. from strength to strength from there. So, you know, good luck for the selection um, and yeah. to, to Birmingham um, in the first place. That you know, be great to, to have you playing on on home soil in a home Commonwealth. Absolutely. Um, just another question here. We've got, a, we've got a few minutes left, so if you've got any further questions um, to ask Catherine or I, just um, Pop them in the comments section. It's nice to get away without any umpiring questions. Um, <laughs> one from Stephen again. Would you like to see bowls in the Olympics? I'd love to see bowls in the Olympics. And I, I, I don't know how many countries short it is of becoming an Olympic sport now, but I think it would be absolutely brilliant for, for the sport, for everyone that plays it, for the promotion of the game. I think it's it will be the best thing that could happen. And I think everyone would agree and everyone would push for it to be included. Yeah, it's a, it's a complex thing. I mean, I'm, uh, mm. I don't profess to be any expert on it because I'm not involved in it, but, you know, it's it's a complex thing. Um, Isn't there a set number of countries that have to play it? Is that how it works? I think it is. I think it's a, it's a number of federations that are involved in it. Um, but there's, there's all sorts of other complex criteria. And I know, um, you know, colleagues at World Bowls, um, 
Gary Smith and, and, and the World Bowls Board have been working so hard um, with the Olympic Federations to, uh, you know, negotiating over a number of years. Um, and we've done, a, there's been a lot of work going on behind the scenes to, to get our game in there. Um, you know, even working with like-minded sports like bocce and um, Patonk and, and those sports to try and get a, you know, get more countries involved because it, they're obviously um, heavily involved in Europe where bowls isn't really, I mean, there's a few countries playing now, but you know, we need to, we need to really partner up with somebody that's got a lot of other countries playing. Um, Absolutely. And of course with, with the Olympics, but from, um, from a UK perspective, or Great Britain perspective, um, the team is entered as Great Britain. So, you know, you're, right. auto you're automatically losing four countries anyway, <laughs> um, because you'll lose England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales for one Team GB um, team. Cool, uh, what a lineup that would be as well. <laughs> would, you, would you pick your uh, ideal team? <laughs> oh, goodness. I think, I just think it's ridiculous. If you think what you could pull together from Scotland and England and Ireland and Wales, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. You're all fighting for five spots if it would be the same format. Well, that that would be outstanding, yeah. wouldn't it? Where, where would you start? I wouldn't want to be a selector in that scenario. <laughs> Neither would I, no. I think, the, I think the men's is where would you start, really? It's, um, you look at the Scottish lineup. Obviously, Foster and Marshall are, are your first first picks on the team sheet, and then then who do you put with them? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you, you, could, you, you could pick a GB team from Scotland alone. To be honest. oh, you could, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah, interesting question from uh, Stephen. I, I I think you know there's a lot of discussion about the Olympics, and you know, let's let's hope one day we'll get there. Um, another question, I think, coming in from Stephen, um, Steve Sargent. Uh, World Bowls has contacted us to see if we're available for the World Bowls Championship on the Gold Coast for September 2021, which suggests they might not be going ahead with it then. OK, I'm not quite sure. I think that's a statement. To be no. honest. Um, so, um, so Steve's from New Zealand. So, you know, there may be discussions going on with, um, uh, with New Zealand about uh, various things. Um, and I, I think there's been an announcement in the last um, week or so about um, Champion of Champions being in New Zealand. Right. Uh, as well. So, um, any more questions on Facebook? Um, I've got one for you, Alan, a quick one. Go on then. Put you on the spot. What is your favourite game that you have ever officiated, or match that you have ever officiated? Is there one that really stands out for you? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think probably the most memorable um, would be the Manchester, Manchester um, 2002 singles final. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy Henry and um, uh, Bobby Donnelly. Um, that was probably the most memorable simply because of the weather, um, simply because it was the biggest um, game I'd marked up to that point yeah um, i don't really remember much about the game to be honest I've, I've watched it back a couple of times just to remind myself what happened um <laughs> but, but it was all a bit of a blur to start with um i do remember that i didn't do the scorecard for three ends um, <laughs> and, uh, and i do remember that i went out without a coin in my pocket and um, nice. so I, I wasn't particularly well prepared um but in terms of certainly with, in terms of world bowls tour um, I think any of the finals I've done have, have been memorable. But having said that, some of the early rounds, um, you know, really stand out. When you get that really good atmosphere and you get a top game going on and you get that buzz and adrenaline going, um, they're the ones that you really remember. Um, yeah. But certainly any of the finals are, 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 are a very different experience. Um, yeah, there's been a few. <laughs> Too many. Okay, uh, any more questions coming in? Last chances, um, if you've got anything else for Catherine, all right, or last one coming in now. If you've got any uh, further questions, about five minutes to go, so um, now's your chance. Um, you've got the world's top lady player here, so get your questions in now. Uh, Weng from New Zealand. Uh, oh yes, just clarifying, Bowls will be, uh, sorry, Bowls New Zealand will be hosting the 2021-2022 World Champion of Champions singles. Um, is Catherine coming to play here and see our beautiful country? 
I'd love to. <laughs> New Zealand is definitely on my bucket list. Um, I think winning the, the national singles outdoors would come before being in that involved in that one, um, which is obviously some test. But yeah, I, w I would absolutely love to come and play in New Zealand. You know, having done Australia, um, having heard so many stories about it, I, I would love to. It's an amazing place. I, I, I was lucky to, to um, go to Christchurch in 2016 for the World Championships. Um, again, Mark, uh, actually, that's another memorable game, marking the, the, the World Singles, um, Shannon McElroy and um, Ryan Bester. Um, wow. Beautiful, beautiful greens, beautiful country. Um, what a lineup as well. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we were lucky to man manage to get a day off um, and went up into the mountains and yeah, absolutely <laughs> it really was. And I think the thing that stuck out for me um, with Christchurch was um, the, the, the devastation that the earth, the major earthquake um, mm. caused and how, how the city's rebuilding. and. Um, that was quite humbling as well to, to kind of see that sense of destruction. Um, yeah, yes. fantastic place, fantastic people, made some really good friends out there and, and some, some of them are online now, so, you know, we, we keep in touch. <laughs> okay, um, nothing further coming in. So I, I want to thank you, Catherine, um, so much for joining. Um, it's been great to talk to you again. Um, no, thank you for having me. Good to see, good to see that you're getting through lockdown and, and come <laughs> through the other side uh, well um, and hopefully you can get out on the rink soon it's been an absolute um, pleasure to have you online with me um thank you take care um see you out on the rinks at some point I yes guess. definitely that's hopefully been, soon not sure what's going on in january yet um that's up in, no. in, terms of, in terms of the world championships so we'll we'll wait and see on that one um big thank you for everybody that joined on zoom and on facebook um, Thank you very much for joining. Thanks for your excellent questions coming through as well. Um, I'll get this video um, published later on today. Um, so it will be up on, online on Facebook. So um, please have a look back. Um, get your colleagues to have a look back as well. Um, been a great discussion, Catherine. Thank you very much. Um, no, thank you. I'll see you again soon. Yes, yeah, see you soon. Take care. Take care then.